Hello and welcome to France 24's Tech Show, I'm Julia Seeger. From beams of light, they've made groundbreaking tools that are revolutionizing the fields of medicine and industry. In this edition, we tell you more about the scientists who were awarded the prestigious Nobel Prize in Physics this year. And Dana J. Cattlecar will turn into a master mentalist as he leads a mind-blowing experiment proving the power of visualization. He will score goals and levitate French sausage with the sole electricity of our brainwaves. That's in a few minutes in Test 24. But first, artificial intelligence has already been used to create poems, songs, and even write theater scripts. Well, now it's entering the realm of art. For the first time ever, Christie's auction off a portrait conceived and made by the software program. Tatiana Nassar has the details. Are computers capable of creativity? At a first glance, even the most experienced of art buffs would probably guess this painting is a portrait from the 18th or 19th century. But the artist's signature is the giveaway clue that this is no ordinary piece of art. An algorithm formula of a software that was fed 15,000 paintings from the 14th to 20th century in order to recognize the visual elements of fine art. There are, of course, humans behind the technology, a French art collective mixing together individual creativity and artificial intelligence. We are the artists because no matter what, it was our intention to create the image, not the algorithms. We used it as a tool, which might be capable of some type of creativity, but that does not take away from the fact that people put it in the instructions, printed on a canvas, signed with a mathematical equation, and put it in a gold frame. The portrait of Edmund Bellamy is making waves in the art world. It is the first piece of art created by an algorithm to be auctioned, going for 380,000 euros, nearly 45 times higher than its estimate. Slightly a tipping point, not only is this recognisably a portrait that a human might have painted, but also then to move it into a sale at Christie's, which is sort of the epicentre of the traditional art world. So will artworks created by artificial intelligence one day be displayed in museums? Computers creating art is not a new concept. In 2016, artificial intelligence produced the next Rembrandt, which looks unmistakably like a portrait painted by the Dutch artist himself. But whether an algorithm can ever be considered as a true artist remains a controversial question. The 2018 Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded to Arthur Ashkin, Gérard Mourou and Donna Strickland for developing tools made from light beams. Ashkin won half of the prize for his work on optical tweezers, which are beams of light that can actually manipulate tiny objects like cells or atoms. Meanwhile, Mourou and Strickland won the other half for creating a technology that generates high-intensity, ultra-short laser pulses which are used for eye surgeries. And as you'll see, Moru discovered this groundbreaking application after an accident occurred in his lab. Let's take a listen. And one of my students, you know, was aligning the laser, was working on the laser. It was this new laser. And uh, accidentally, he got the laser beam in his eye. So this is, a, of course, we take that very seriously. We take the student to the hospital, and, uh, and then the um, ophthalmologist looked at his eye and was very surprised. And he said, but what kind of laser do you have? Because they are familiar with lasers, you know. But this one was a new type of laser. And, and the student asked him, why? Why, is it, why are you asking these questions? And he said, because your damage is perfect. And Dana J. Cattlecar joins us now. Uh, thank you so much for being with us. You actually met with Dr. Moreau. Uh, what exactly is perfect damage? I didn't even know there was such a thing. Well, Julia, it's because of the nature of the laser that uh, Dr. Moreau and his team developed. Uh, what, so what is the nature? First of all, high intensity. Second, short duration. Now, these two factors combine to deliver uh, 
ultra precise incisions and that's how these lasers found its way into the field of ophthalmology as you can see here there's a femtosecond laser and there's a nanosecond laser now femtosecond is extremely short duration it is one millionth of a billionth of a second and it's because of the short duration and high intensity that there is no collateral damage and that's why the doctor said there's a beautiful damage uh, in that student's eye. Now, this has other interesting applications in the field of industry. For example, uh, in, uh, in laser cutting of different materials like metals, glass and plastic. So how does this laser actually work? How did, was this technique developed? Right. Well, it essentially consists of a short pulse, of, uh, short pulse from a laser, which is then stretched over time. Now, this stretch laser is then amplified and then it is recompressed. So you can imagine all the amplification of that long, the, the stretching of that laser, it packs a lot of right. energy. And that's how you get this high intensity lasers for a very short period of time. And a great way to think about it is to think of a... Like a karate chop. Yeah, that's, exactly. a, that's a great analogy that Dr. Muru told me. So in, in a, when you deliver a karate chop, you essentially pack a lot of energy and it's delivered in a fraction of a second. I read that... A karate black belt can can break a slab of concrete by delivering a karate chop, which lasts only for, I think it's 15 milliseconds or so. Right, but you do have is... to be a professional to yeah, do that. <laughs> now, this could also be the solution to uh, space debris, but also nuclear waste management. That's right. Space debris is a big problem. You know, there are millions of these tiny particles floating around that can create uh, real nuisance for expensive equipments like satellites or even the International Space Station. So in order to deal with it, uh, these in high intensity lasers that uh, Dr. Moore and his team developed, they have now scaled up to a greater level. And in the future, they are envisaging that these lasers can be fired on these individual uh, components and they can reduce the velocity of these uh, of this uh, small debris. And because of that, they can be deorbited, so it can come back into the atmosphere and they can burn. And similarly, as far as the nuclear waste management is concerned, this high intensity, the high uh, peak power of these lasers can be used to deteriorate the radioactivity of nuclear waste materials. Dan and Jay Cattle Car there. We're going to move on to a very mental Test 24. We are about to prove to you that telekinesis is indeed possible, or at least this is as close as it gets. For the first time on the set of Tech 24, Dan and Jay Cattlecar is going to try to score a goal with the sole power of his brain. Dan, you're going to have to focus, concentrate, and get into a meditative state. Yes, well, Julia, if faith can move mountains, I'm sure I'll be able to move this tiny ball into the back of the net. Let's try. That was very quick. Yeah. I Congratulations. Know. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> well, so the real playground is not this table, but the visual cortex, the part of the brain that uh, lies at the back of the head. Uh, it has the so-called mirror neurons, which uh, have a peculiar functionality. So they function in a similar manner when you look at something and when you imagine the same thing. So if I look at the ball moving from left to right and imagine that the ball is moving from the left, from left to right, the similar neurons will be fired. Now, it's an electrical activity that is interpreted by a computer. Now, as right. you can see, the, the, the ball has a blue tinge. So there's a Bluetooth connection to it. And this Bluetooth connection is connected to a computer, which interprets this electrical activity. And the, uh, the startup mentalista has a database of all these electrical impulses. And each impulse corresponds to a, a certain activity. In right, this case, command. yeah, like a command. Uh, mm. In this case, the ball moving from left to right. So that's how you are able to move objects just by the uh, power of the mind. I mean, there's, of course, uh, there are a set of instructions and right. algorithm, but it's still quite a big leap uh, in technology. And the same company did another interesting experiment. This time they were able to levitate French sausage or so-called saucisson. Yeah, it's the same principle. Again, that activity was associated with a certain trigger. And the trigger in this sense was the uh, number of electrical impulses that were received. As you can see here, uh, the user's friends, they're trying to distract him by playing music. And he's trying to keep the... He's, he's pretty good. Yeah, it's, it's levitating, as you can see, the shadow on the table. So yeah, it's again associated with a certain activity. In this case, the number of triggers, the number of electrical right. impulses. So there are almost 60, I think, and that's how you either levitate or bring the plate down. And using a similar principle, a person in Brazil that was paralyzed was able to drive a Formula One car with the power of his brain. There's no 
steering wheel, no pedals. How did that work? Well, that was incredible. As you can see in the images, uh, Roberto Hubner Mendes, uh, who suffers from paralysis, he managed to drive this Formula One car just by the power of his mind. He was seated in the driver's seat. As you mentioned, there's no steering wheel, there's no accelerator pe pedal. Just the thinking that he wants to go forward made the car go forward. And again, it's as you mentioned, it's the same principle of associating every command with certain action. And uh, two years ago, the University of Florida was able to create the world's first brain drone race. That's right, Julia. It was the world's first brain-controlled interface race in which 16 pilots were able to navigate drones by just using their brains. Uh, it's again the same principle, the EEG activity was interpreted and it was associated with a particular activity, whether it was lifting up the drone or making it navigate left or right. So it's, it's the same principle again. All right, and if you meditate a lot, you're probably better at this than others. Thank you so much, Dan. That brings us to the end of this week's edition of Tech 24, but you can watch it again on our website, france24.com. See you next time. Thank you.